Welcome back to Uninvested, where we break down everything entrepreneurship and tech so anyone can understand. I'm Sahil, and today we'll be interviewing Vinay Iyengar. Vinay has an impressive background starting at Harvard before working in arguably the most storied venture capital firm, Bessemer Venture Partners. Since then, he's gone on to work at Two Sigma Foundation Capital, where he focuses on very early stage companies. All of this alongside a plethora of angel investors. Welcome, Vinay. <laughs> One trend, you know, looking at your background, you went to Harvard, to Bessemer, to Two Sigma Capital, to Foundation Capital. It seems like you kind of go from bigger organizations to smaller ones. I think you can have more impact at smaller organizations. Um, and so I think early in one's career, it makes a lot of sense to work at places that are large and established and that, you know, have a track record of training people and teaching people. But once you feel like you've learned all that you can learn, um, I'm the type of person, at least, who, who uh, has always enjoyed trying to take a bet on myself whenever possible. And so I think that was sort of the reason, especially when I think about the transition from Bessemer to Two Sigma, that was very much coming from my own sort of entrepreneurial itches and my desire to go try and build something new from the ground up. I want to push back on that. Like when you're at a big organization, you might have more reach, more resources to actually make a bigger impact. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's fair to an extent. I think... Um, that's probably specifically true if you're in a more senior role or you're a decision maker at a very large organization. But as someone early in their career, it's, it's you know, you can't just get a job running a large organization or business, whether it's a large venture fund or a large company or startup. Um, and so I've always thought that, uh, you know, the quickest way to accelerate one's career and get to one of those roles where you're actually be a decision maker is to join an organization that's small and growing and grow with them and help turn it into something big. And by the time it's big, hopefully you're in a role where you can actually have some, some real impact. Right now at Foundation Capital, you're making the most impact you've had in your career? Definitely don't know that. I can't say that for sure. Um, I think every day I do get to work with founders really closely. Um, and you know, in, in my role as a, as a board member and advisor to companies, I definitely feel like I, I can have some impact, but um, you know, pr probably again, more than I had five years ago, but I still have a long, long way to go and a lot more impact that I want to have in the world. So, um, you know, I, I'm very much still just getting started. You guys really focus on early, early stage startups before that quote of, you know, the death valley of startups where you don't have any customers. You're really just an idea of you invest based off founder conviction. It's, it's a few things, right? One, I think we believe very strongly in focus and going very, very deep, building a thesis around a space. Um, as an example, now I'm spending a ton of time in and around all things generative AI. Um, and I think part of the, part of the idea is like, if you meet hundreds and hundreds of companies that are focused on a very specific problem area or a very specific type of technology, the, the next founder you meet, even if there isn't sort of clear traction by way of, uh, metrics or, uh, you know, product, you sort of have a better intuition of what's a, what's a good idea or what isn't. So I think that's, that's one thing is like when you, when you go really early and you're very focused, that helps you drive better decision-making. Um, but then to your point, I think the second thing is really, um, making bets on teams and trying to find teams that are truly exceptional or extraordinary in some way. So you kind of have a thesis and then go find the founders like within your thesis area. Has it ever been in a scenario where the other way around has happened? You found it founder that was outside of your thesis? Yeah, uh, it's it's definitely happened many times. I would say, uh, you know, part of the advantage also of, of going very early is you could actually shape that founder's thesis building as well. And your pattern recognition and all the previous conversations you have with founders actually help you sort of uh, almost co-create with that founder. So at the stage we're investing, we almost like to think of ourselves as like a co-founder. Um, and certainly we wouldn't, we, we are not taking that level of credit and it's really founders that drive great outcomes, but um, we like to think of it as like a melding of the DCs that ultimately helps us really build big and exciting companies. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I would say to your direct question, like who's really driving the thesis is the founder or the VC. I would say it's almost always the founder, actually. We, we can come up with a high level perspective of like, hey, I think this market is very interesting or this technology is interesting here are the ways that we, we believe you can commercialize it. Um, here are the go-to-market strategies that are effective. But the actual like core insight around a startup, I believe, always has to come from a founder and from their unique experience. It's, it's very hard for us to come up with that and then go find the founder. 
Um, so, so when I say we're thesis driven, what I really mean by that is we, we follow high level themes and trends and patterns. Um, but the actual idea behind like great startups, I think always comes from like brilliant entrepreneurs. You mentioned people building startups around their insights, probably typically like an experience they had in the industry, but what do you do? Like you come across a founder, you love his idea, but he necessarily doesn't have the skills or the internal team himself to put it to fruition. Entering a world where the ability to build technology is slowly being democratized, right? You have a bunch of these low code, no to code tools that exist, uh, whether it's things like retool or whatever that help folks who are not uh, builders themselves build and iterate with an idea. I think also, you know, it's increasingly easy to sell a customer on like a prototype or a demo or an MVP that isn't actually the product, but sort of like a almost just the front end of what a product looks like. And people can use tools like Figma or Canva to design that, yeah, yeah. Um, create an experience that feels like you're using the product. So I think, you know, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, I think it was very hard for a founder to be non-technical and for them to go out and, and sort of really build a very, very large technology company. But I think over time, we've seen the playing field level. Uh, and I like to call this trend like the democratization of creation, like this idea that, uh, you know, it's never been easier to build um, and to build products that are really like robust and feature rich, right? Because you also have this whole ecosystem of like third party APIs and libraries, things like Stripe, uh, Twilio, you know, Shopify, if you're trying to build some sort of e-commerce business, right? So you have a bunch of these things that now just make it a lot easier to build. Um, I do tend to believe that technical founders probably outperform just because their product velocity can be a lot faster, right? So they can experiment and iterate probably more quickly, but that certainly doesn't mean it's impossible for a non-technical founder in today's world to to build a really big and exciting business. Going off that, would you want the founder to be using the no-code co no tools themselves? You know, nowadays you can go on a plethora of outsourcing, you know, platforms that had someone cook you up a MVP, maybe just to show proof of concept. Again, my bias would be towards people who actually build it themselves because I think just the act of like building and designing a product is just so important for an entrepreneur to do because like it, it's almost like so much gets lost in translation if you mock something up and then give it to a third party agency to try and build like uh, you, you're not really building what the user really wants and you're not you're not able to iterate and experiment as fast and again I think the the, the most important thing in the early days of companies is like your pace of experimentation needs to be very very high. Um, and so the only way to do that is for you, the founder or CEO, to actually be in the loop uh, during that actual product creation process. What you're talking about is like the lean startup model of what YC preaches, iterate path, fast, ship new versions all the time, kind of balance that with doing heavy research, you know, design research before you even create a product. I am a big believer in what people call the lean startup methodology, which is like yeah. the idea that you should build as little as possible and talk to users as much as possible in the early days of the startup. And so what that means is, I, I think it's a little bit of both of what you were saying, right? It involves not really like writing a single line of code, but but trying to build an experiment and, and create things and put them in front of users that are like truly the minimum viable product and try and get their feedback and try and understand would they use this, would they pay for this, is this solving their pain point? And then going back to the drawing board, iterating, talking to more users. And so I think this continuous loop of like building the minimal viable product and talking to as many users as possible and, and you know, doing that virtuous cycle as much as you can, I think that is the playbook for building a great company. Um, and again, I, I think there are, for every rule, there are exceptions. There, there are ways to do this that uh, are, are totally different, but... The, the method I've seen work the best is is sort of what I just described. You yourself, it's on your LinkedIn, you said you had a failed venture. When is it time for a founder to give up or maybe move on to the next idea? My answer to this is pretty simple. It's when the founders lose passion and hunger and, and just lose interest, like that's that's a good time to stop. But as long as someone is still like really passionate and interested and excited, like, you know, sometimes these things take years and years and a lot of persistence, but... Uh, it's the true believers and the true optimists who ultimately persevere and build things that really matter. 
Uh, in my case, like I, that just wasn't me. Like at the time, I was, I wasn't even full time on it. I was still a student. Uh, I, you know, realized pretty quickly, like I'm interested in a whole bunch of other things. And and while this is exciting, I was getting distracted, and um, it it just it wasn't something I loved at the time. And so I realized, hey, I got to move on. Um, and so I think when people are motivated by this fundamental love and this fundamental desire to solve a problem, like again, that's when they'll be most persistent and when they'll really go on to build something that's really interesting. Uh, and in my case, I think it was clear that I, at the time, probably wasn't doing it for the right reasons um, and didn't have that that love and passion. Um, and so I'm glad I, I sort of cut it off when I did and, and moved on to other things. So is the love and passion, would you say, have to be for the idea of what you're trying to solve or is it for building for trying to have like a company look like yeah that, that's an awesome question and it's something i think about a lot and i think my my uh opinion on that has changed over time i think i historically used to think like the best companies the founders need to have like this deep love of the domain mm -hmm. deep empathy with the problem that they're solving like they have to just like be obsessed and that's the only way to build a great company but then you look at examples of, of great companies that have been built by really passionate young people who aren't necessarily excited about a specific domain, but are just excited about the idea of building something that matters. Um, I think Brex might be like the best and most famous example of this. And, you know, a couple of folks who are in YC who were just like pivoting around, trying a bunch of different things, found this idea that really worked and went for it. And, uh, you know, I, I've heard this now many times of like successful companies that start really because the founders just want to be entrepreneurs and and no other reason other than like passion to build and be entrepreneurs and they pivot a bunch and experiment with a bunch of different ideas and finally something sticks and they go on and build something that's like very big and exciting. And so um, I think my, my opinion on this is, has sort of evolved over time. This lean startup model to constantly tell people to iterate, iterate, leads them away from their original idea. I always think if you're stuck to your one domain, you're so empathetic about one issue, you might miss a bigger opportunity. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think through this process of even um, talking to users, you discover new pain points, new problems, <laughs> new markets. Um, and so, and, and I think, you know, in many ways, you actually have an advantage being an outsider and approaching a market or a problem without being a domain expert or someone who comes from that industry. You're an outsider and you have new ideas and, and new ways of innovating and you aren't like bogged yeah. down or stuck by like traditions or, uh, uh, oh, we should do it this way because it's always been done this way. You can sort of uh, approach things with a fresh, fresh mind. And I think that's that's valuable. I saw you have a lot of personal investments as well. So do you treat those any differently than you do when you're investing within a firm? Or is it kind of you carry the same mindset, same thesis? You look out for the same things. I think my philosophy with the angel stuff has been a few things. One, it's, you know, my my focus as a VC is fairly narrow. I, I spend most of my time in B2B software, um, you know, spending a lot of time these days, again, in all things AI. Um, but there are a bunch of other things that I'm, like, super interested and excited about. And so it's a chance for me to, one, like, just play around with these new markets and new ideas that I think are really interesting. An example of that is I... I was a very early check in a company called Backbone, which makes a, a controller that snaps onto your iPhone and basically turns it into a gaming device. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not like a big gamer, but I think gaming is like a fascinating market and yeah. a massive one. And so I uh, was you know, lucky to put an early check into that company. They're doing really well. Um, and so, so one is a chance to, to learn about new markets and new opportunities. And then secondly, it's a chance to support friends who are starting companies who... Um, I believe in and I'm going to help them anyways because they're my friends and I care about them. And so I'm like, if you're going to, if you're going to be successful and I'm going to help you, I might as well like benefit if, if, if things go well. And so that's sort of the second, second bucket for me is just a chance to support friends and, and, in helping them achieve their dreams. Um, and so for the most part, a lot of my angel investments are, um, the sort of small checks early on into a company. I'm probably not as hands on with them as I am with the actual, investments that I make from the fund. Because again, with with a fund, you're we're investing millions of dollars. We're owning hopefully at least double digit percent, you know, of of 
these companies often will have a board seat. We have uh, an obligation to be really involved. Um, with the angel checks, it's like you know, small, small amounts into into early rounds, and um, and so it's it's a different uh, sort of risk profile and different involvement. But um, you know, try to be helpful wherever I can be. But so, is there any one where you feel? you know, very tied to the mission, you know, not just as you think it's cool, but maybe the product wasn't even there yet. You might have invested way too early, but you were like, I really believe in what they're trying to solve. I'm also uh, reminded of this because I just spoke with a founder yesterday who I put an angel check into who um, I'm a huge fan of. And it's a company called Reflex AI. And basically what they're doing is they're using a lot of the latest um, advancements in generative AI to actually train and do quality assurance for crisis counselors and crisis response people. So an example being like folks who are operating 911 lines or or crisis lines for the VA or any of these nonprofits. Um, these people are dealing with really like intense life and death situations um, and often don't have good ways to train those operators. And so now we can we have these Gen AI models that can actually um, sort of help train people more effectively, but also like QA those conversations in real time because we now have sort of AI that has a lot more intelligence around conversations. Um, and so that's going to be, I'm like super excited about um, because, you know, it's just a, it's a, it's a, one of those interesting areas where some of the newest advances in AI is having like a clear social impact on the world and clearly making people better and hopefully actually saving lives in the process. But do you think there are products that could be hurt with the incorporation of AI, just, you know, startups just trying to throw an AI aspect in there? I, I mean, I think AI, generally speaking, has a lot of risks and a lot of downsides. Um, I mean, one, just, I, I'm, I'm not an economist by training, but like, th there's a world in which some of this generative AI stuff really has a meaningful impact on jobs and like automates a lot of jobs away. Um, and I think that can have probably really negative economic impacts. I, I think at the same time, like I'm also very bullish on on the power of, of AI and some of these new businesses to create new jobs and new opportunities and ultimately grow the economy. Um, but but the jury's out on that. Uh, you know, secondly, I think AI also has a lot of, uh, you know, issues with bias and with, uh, you know, th there's this very famous example of a, a chatbot that Microsoft created that ultimately ended up spewing out a bunch of racist, misogynistic, homophobic content because it's trained on human data and ultimately like devolve into this very scary thing. Um, and so I think like, you know, there are a lot of risks in AI. Um, also these, a lot of these models operate as black boxes today. We don't really know how they work. Um, we don't really know why they're making the decisions that they're making. And so, um, you know, if people start to trust AI too much and don't have a, a good sense of how exactly it's, it's coming up with the answers it's coming up with, like, I think that poses a lot of risk to society. So there are a huge number of like issues that I think are are out there with AI. Um, but at the same time, again, I think it promises to be really transformative and and can like push us forward and in in really meaningful ways. And so um, it's about this question of like how do we develop AI in a way that's responsible and ethical um, and transparent. Um, and if we can do that, I think I think we're we're in for a very bright future. So what do you think more so like the dangers? I mean, I, th I think there are a bunch of issues and threats that this new AI stuff poses. And, and to your point about security, I think one of the biggest things we're actually seeing data around is the the rise of these phishing and smishing attacks. So basically, you know, I can now train a model that sounds just like Sahil's voice and I can call up your mom and make it seem like you got kidnapped um, and, you know, ex exploit her for money, right? Like, like the, the threats here are pretty endless. Um, and even, I, I'm sure you've noticed this on your phone, like you, we're getting more and more of these like SMS, uh, bot attacks that, yeah, yeah. that are, you know, basically just phishing schemes that are trying to get you to divulge some sort of private information such that people can hack you. Um, and so that's just one of the many, many risks that, that, um, this AI stuff introduces, not not to mention just the fact that now we have a bunch of systems that are just automated chatbot seem like humans. Um, if those get hacked or exploited in some ways, um, that again poses a, a huge threat to, to humans. So um, 
the risks are are very large, and I think uh, specifically to your question, I think I think security companies could be some of the biggest winners from this uh, rise of, of generative AI, and there's going to be increasing need for for products that sort of keep us safe. Not technical solutions would be like developing a safe room with your family or for instance, you know, just common sense, but how could technologies be developed to protect people? So there, there are all sorts of technologies that are sort of being developed now. One is just, uh, you know, you, you can obviously develop a model and train a model to, to emulate a human, but you can also like develop models that actually can detect when it's an AI versus a human and, and be able to block the sort of AI detected content. So like, there are obviously like AI-based approaches to doing this sort of stuff. Um, I'm seeing a bunch of companies in the security simulation space, so developing like these uh, simulations that help train employees and help them be aware of knowing like when they they actually could be uh, being being smished versus you know when it's a real threat. Um, so so I think there are a lot of opportunities. There are even things like just like fundamental new advances in security that can um, that can help. Uh, prevent some of these like prompt injection attacks and and things like that. So the the the, the opportunities are pretty endless here. Um, at the same time, I think like nothing beats some of the human prevention tactics of just uh, of just figuring out a safe word and stuff like that. Does have you ever considered potentially shifting from the VC route and actually once again trying to be a founder and going to go build? If you would, like where would it be? Yeah, I and mean, I think about it all the time. Absolutely, I think I think uh, <laughs> this stuff is super exciting, and this is like one of those game changing technologies that will really redefine the next you know decade and cer- certainly the next century um in terms of specific areas i'm excited about i am very excited about what i call uh service as a software so if you think about like the last decade of innovation it's been driven by like the rise of cloud computing and what people call software as a service um and part of my thesis is that like the biggest area where this technology is going to be applied is in like human services so things like anytime humans are communicating with other people um or like doing a professional service for another human um that's something where ai now has the capability to actually augment or automate that process um and so now you know it's possible that you can actually run a services business like a professional services business but you augment or replace the labor with ai and now you have a services businesses that run with the gross margins of a software business. Uh, And I'll give you a very practical example of that. We at Foundation are investors in a company called Converse AI, which makes software that uh, helps automate the phone screening process for staffing agencies. So staffing agencies, you know, basically are like screening a bunch of people for jobs and they have call centers often overseas that are actually like running these interviews. And now it's possible that you can light up this AI driven call center overnight that now suddenly just interviews all your candidates for you. Um, and so you can imagine like the staffing agency of the future has no employees, is just an AI call center that now runs like a software company. And so when I talk about service as software, it's really this trend of like, um, how do you think about services, professional services businesses that are truly just like uh, AIs in the background? To counter that, do you think there's any services i guess that can't be replaced by ai all screening that's one but you know when you go deeper in like that same process maybe not the, my my view on this is i think it's all about the the how high stakes are these interactions and how many dis, like critical decisions are being made right in in the process of like phone screening a candidate for example like you're basically basically helping filter the top of the funnel um if you take the other extreme example is like doctors interacting with humans where you're actually like making a diagnosis or something right like i think that's really scary and you you want to keep humans in the loop as much as possible Mm -hmm. because those decisions are very high stakes whereas something like in the healthcare context you know i'm seeing a bunch of really interesting companies that do things like uh appointment scheduling right so typically when you call in to a doctor's office to you know schedule an appointment maybe they verify your insurance eligibility, things like that. I think that's like an amazing use of generative AI today where it's like, you know, if the AI messes up somehow, like the stakes are, are actually fairly low, but if the AI messes up like a diagnosis, like that's that's a big deal. And so um, I think initially that's how I think, that's sort of my framework for thinking about where it needs to be applied at first. But 
in the long, long term, I, I'm fairly bullish that like this technology is going to get good enough to actually slowly take over some of these really high stakes decisions. But um, I think having a human in the loop is always going to be a really important component of this. Last question I ask everyone in interview is, has there been any routine that you've kind of kept throughout the years? You know, I, I think a lot about routines, especially it's the new year now, so I'm thinking a lot about resolutions and routines. I'm not a very routine-oriented person. I want to be more of one. Um, I always try to make time for my friends. Like, that's something that's really, really important to me is, like, every year just making time to be there in person, like, whether it's doing a trip or two or, or, or at least just, like, spending a few days in person with the pe people who are very, very close to me. That's something that, like, always just keeps me very grounded and very supported. Um, and so... Yeah, I think it's like it's just like spending time with those people, and they, they also happen to be the people who like inspire me the most and energize me the most, um, and sort of help me keep my fire for what I do. But with that, this has been Unabested. I'm Sahil, and I'm Vinay. Thank you. This is a personal video. Any views or opinions represented in this video are personal and do not represent those of people, institutions, or organizations we may or may not be associated with in a professional or personal capacity. The views expressed are for entertainment purposes only and not to be misinterpreted.